All right, all right. Are you all ready for a new series? Some of you are like, oh, some of you are sad. I know you really enjoyed. Some of you loved the last series. Some of you are like, I don't know, scared to death now. And now we're doing a series called The Day I Died. And you're like, what is going on here? Uh, no, this will be a good series. Trust me. Uh, today, though, as we get ready to launch into the series, let, let, let's have a little bit of fun here, okay? I'm going to name some phobias and let me, let, let's see if you can identify some of them. You just shout it out if you can identify what this is a fear of, okay? So we're going to start easy. Arachnophobia is the fear of? Spiders. Very good. Claustrophobia, the fear of? Yep, tight spaces, closed spaces. Aquaphobia, the fear of water. Very good. Uh, arithmophobia, the fear of math. <laughs> Numbers, <laughs> but yes, math. Some of you are like, that is what I'm afraid of. All right, now this is going to get weirder and, and uh, much more difficult because most of these I'd never heard of, okay? So I'm going to just throw some really strange ones at you. Uh, and I'm going to even butcher them, okay? So you're not even going to be able to identify what it could be, okay? Uh, our... Archibutrophobia. Ar- Archibutrophobia? Archri- yeah. It's the fear of peanut butter getting stuff, stuck on the roof of your mouth. Yeah? Any of you struggle with that one? <laughs> no? Nomophobia. Anyone? Some of you have this and struggle with it. It's the fear of being without your cell phone. Nomo. Okay. Uh, xanthophobia. Uh, this would stink. It's the fear of the color yellow. Well, uh, a blutophobia. Some of my kids have this. It's the fear of bathing. So, <laughs> optophobia, the fear of closing one's eyes. I don't even know how that. Oh, no, opening one's eyes. That's even worse. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, this one's hypno. Hypnopopto- hold on. Hippopotostropnatomostrostiquipedalophobia. Fear of long words. <laughs> that is mine. That is mine. Omphalophobia. Fear of belly buttons. That stinks because you're all stuck with one. Okay. Phobophobia. Fear of fears. And this is one. It's probably the number one fear in humanity. It's uh, thanatophobia. It's not the fear of Thanos. It's the fear of death. Fear of death. Why in the world do so many people struggle with that? It's because it's so final, right? It's, it's, it's over. Everything from here and now is over. And this series that we're going to be looking at, The Day I Died, is going to lead us into a subject that while uh, you're not having to face physical death or stare that down, we are going to actually take a deep stare or a look into something that I believe all of us should have actually looked into which or stared into and faced a spiritual death, if you will, that most of us are, quite frankly, scared to death to, to deal with or to really process. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Check it out here. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must dis- deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, this is interesting because when we read that, we're like, okay, want to be my disciple. Disciple is just a follower. So a follower of Jesus, whoever wants to be a follower of Jesus. And most people be like, yeah, yeah, I'd like to be a follower of Jesus. Sure. But then we got to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow me. Now, for many of us, when we think of this, take up our cross. We, we think of crosses through kind of our lens of their, like, there's the cross on the wall. And it's just, it's, it's this icon that kind of it becomes synonymous with religion or God or Jesus, and, uh, but we don't think of it through the lens of uh, 2,000 years ago when they were doing crucifixions, which for them to take up their cross, it was ultimately their death sentence. When someone was crucified, this is almost like, man, this is it's like punishment on top of the punishment. You have to carry your own cross to the place where they're going to crucify you on it. That's what you would have to do, carry your cross. So when you saw someone carrying a cross, they were carrying the cross, the means by which they were going to die on that thing. And and so I can imagine while people were carrying the cross, you want to know what that gave them time to do? Process what was coming, right? 
It, while they're carrying that cross, they're literally thinking about, I know what is coming. Maybe they're processing what got me to this place, that I'm getting this type of punishment. Maybe they're processing the finality of life, but it means they had, they had time to really think through what was coming to an end. And during this series, what I want to do is I want to give us time to process what is really meant to come to an end in our lives. What was supposed to come to an end in your life? And maybe ask the question, have I really done this? Have I done what Jesus invited all followers to do, which is carry their cross? Have I processed what was supposed to die in me, or at least what was supposed to die? And so, as I think about it for you and I, many of us, when we said yes to Jesus, we often said yes based on what we thought we were getting, not, not necessarily through the lens of what we were getting rid of. Or what was dying in us, right? Like, like, just think about it. Probably most of you, when you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've done that, you probably thought to yourself, well, I, I want to receive eternal life and not eternal separation from God. I want heaven, not hell. Grace, not wrath. I, I, I want forgiveness, not shame. You know, it's, it's this type of exchange, but you weren't thinking through the lens of, I want to surrender my life to Christ, and I want my old life to be dead. Probably you didn't even really think about it through, through that lens, and yet faith in Christ is not just this add-on, which is what many of us did. We're like, hey, what can I get from him? And let, let me just kind of add that on to my life. Like, here's my life, and I'm just adding Jesus to it. But here's the deal. Christ was not meant to be an add-on to our past life. It was a replacement of your past life. Are, are you tracking here with me? Christ was not supposed to be an add-on. He was supposed to be a replacement. But unfortunately, that's not what most of us process. We, we did kind of the add-on, Jesus add-on to whatever I'm doing. I, th I think about, there's a, a funny book years ago. It was called Stuff Christians Love. And it was this author who wrote about just honestly ridiculous things. Then he was just calling out the church and Christians for some of the ridiculous things that we allow in our lives. And there was one chapter, I think it was called Booty, Booty, Jesus, Booty, Booty. And I know some of you are like, what? And literally, this, was, this is what it was about. Down, the guy lived down in Atlanta, uh, Georgia area, and there was a really popular, uh, well-known radio station down in that area that played like hip-hop and rap and things like that. And as you can imagine, on a lot of hip-hop or rap radio stations, there's a lot of really crass music about booties. So there's a lot of booty booty happening on that, on that radio station. Well, on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., they they played the gospel song of the week right in the middle of it. And the DJs would all get hyped up and they're talking about, oh yeah, when I grew up going to church and this was my favorite gospel song. And so they would literally play all of these songs and right in the middle at 11 o'clock Sunday morning, gospel song of the week, and you'd hear, uh, you know, like, oh, the friend I have in Jesus or his eyes are on the sparrow or, or whatever it might be, or lean on me, whatever. And, and literally, you get this moment of Jesus. And then the next song would go right back to booty booty. And so he was like, this is what totally Christians do. We're like, hey, can we just have our booty booty insert Jesus? More booty booty on the other side of it. And unfortunately, this is what m many of us thought saying yes to Jesus was like. Can we just do an add-on to some of the, the, the wrong things that are in my life and I'll just sandwich Jesus with the other things that I like controlling in my life, I like having in my life, that quite frankly don't belong in my life. But Jesus has just become a little add-on to the booty in our life. And, and he wasn't meant to be an add-on. He was supposed to be a replacement of your life and of your old life, your past life. And so Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. And then he goes on in verse 25 to say this. He says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. Okay, so now when he says whoever wants to save their life will Lose it, meaning if you're trying to control your own life, save your own life on your own, if your eternity rests in your abilities to save your own life, guess what? You're going to lose in the end. However, whoever loses their life for me will find it. Now, when he says loses their life for me, he's not saying if you die for me. That's not, not his point. But he is saying that your old life, your, your old self, that thing needs to die. The, the life that you're really looking for, the abundant life, is actually found when you let go of control of your life. I pictured a little bit like this. A, a, a few weeks ago, I told a story 
of when I saved my wife's life in a, a river in Montana. We were, this was while we were still dating. We weren't yet married, and it was glacier runoff and uh, water. And, and there's a part of the story that I kind of just skipped. I said she, she kind of went under the water, and then she popped out. Well, I want to tell you a little bit of what happened when she went under. Okay, so she's going toward this, like, a rock face. It was kind of like this, this cliff face uh, on this tube. And as she comes to it, she loses control of her tube, and she gets sucked under the water, and she gets sucked right here, kind of underneath the rock face. The water had been wearing it down. It was like it almost went under here. It was kind of down underneath, uh, cut down underneath the water. And she is literally holding herself off of the rocks. Now, she'll tell you I was holding, that she was holding herself off of the rocks because she didn't want to scrape up her body. <laughs> scrape up her face. She's like, I don't want to ruin my face. You know, so she's, scra- she's holding herself and holding her whole, basically her whole life, you know, off the rocks until she came to realize that here I am and I'm trying to control the situation. Like that's what she was doing. She's like, I, I went into this thing. Boosh. She's like controlling the situation, but then realizing that while she's holding herself there, the water pressure is actually holding her Uh, right where she was at, keeping her from moving anywhere. So as long as she's in control of the situation, she's actually stuck under the water, moving nowhere. Until she got to the place where she's like, I just gotta let go. And she let go, and that's when she shot 30 feet out downstream. Once she let go, but so many of us are doing this in life where we're like, I'm just gonna control the situation. As long as you're controlling it, you're actually holding yourself in this place of destruction and ultimate death. And he says, whoever wants to, you know, save their life, you're going to have to lose it. You're just going to have to let go. Quit trying to control it on your own. That's how you actually save your life. And then Jesus goes on. He says this in the very next verse. And, uh, and, I, and I love this because some of you here, some of you might be like, man, I struggle with the, with the whole deal of like faith, maybe. And you think of life more through the lens of logic versus faith. And if this is you, guess what? Jesus is speaking to you in this next verse. He's going to lean into like, hey, I want you to have a, a logical kind of argument and, and, and internal wrestling right now. He says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I love this because he's going to say, All right, let me lean into logic right now for, for a moment. For some of you who struggle with the, the concept of faith and surrendering everything to the Lord, let's lean into a logical argument. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul. My, my wife, once again, while she was stuck underneath that water and being held against the, the rock, she, her biggest thing was that she was actually thinking about was her face. She'll tell you that. She'll be like, I just didn't want to scrape up my face. But after being stuck there for so long, you know, for 10 seconds, which felt like an eternity, especially in like glacier runoff water, she finally got to the place of, what good is it for me to save my face if I forfeit my life? Right? Time to let go. What good is it if you gain the whole world, yet forfeit your life? I, I picture this a little bit uh, like Taylor Swift right now. This, any Swifties in the room? You know, we had a bunch of middle-aged men raise their hand on Thursday night. It was really awkward, okay? No, okay, there's, a, there's some of you here. I, I was, I don't know, I've been kind of fascinated. I'm not a Swiftie, Okay. I've just heard it's a thing. Uh, but I, uh, I've been fascinated by this girl because it seems like she can't lose right now. Like her Eras tour sold out. Her new movie that she released, she didn't even go through like the traditional route. She like just produced it on her own and released it to her own set of, of, of theaters that she wanted to. I mean, she's doing, and sold out. Like, and, and breaking the box office in how she's doing it. And now she's dating you know, Travis Kelsey and all these people on the planet all of a sudden are thinking Travis Kelsey's gonna get good all of a sudden. And they're like, oh, this guy's finally gonna make it. Oh, Lord. The guy's like an amazing football player, folks. Okay, but anyhow, all of a sudden his jerseys start selling 600% increase in Travis Kelsey's jerseys are being sold just because he's dating her. Like, I mean, it's just like crazy. Uh, and then there's the, they, t- they talk about the number of people who are watching the games because they might get a glimpse of her watching the game. Is that not weird to anyone else? 
Like just people, I'm watching a game to watch someone watch a game. And yet they're doing it. And I, I think if we were making the argument or the question of could we, could we make the argument that Taylor Swift perhaps has kind of gained the world. Like if there's a way to win in this realm and be like I gained everything, I got it all, I think we could make the argument that she gained the world. However, not, I, I can't definitively speak into her walk with God. I just don't see any evidence of it. That's just... I don't. That's ultimately between God and, and, and her, not me and her. But I, I look at it and I go, what, what good is it if she gains the world but forfeits her soul? What good would it be? No, no good in that. So now, so now to surrender your life to him, it, yes, it might save your soul. But can I address something that I think many people are actually afraid of in this idea of surrendering it all to God? Like dying to myself, dying to my old self, and surrendering it all to Jesus. And it's this. It's this idea that if I do this, is my life going to be boring? Does life, if I, if I die to myself, does it all just become boring? Like I imagine, I don't know, when I was a little kid and I thought about, I don't know, the the churchy, churchy person. I don't know why. I always pictured him really old, so I apologize to all the old people. Um, But I pictured him as like old old people sitting around in prayer meetings, just praying or going to Sunday school. I was like, that just sounds so boring. Like, I don't don't want that. Like, that's not the life I want. Like, that's just honest. If, If I could be honest with you. In fact, even as a little kid, when I would go to church, let me show you a picture. This is the picture of Jesus that I would often find myself coloring in church. It's cartoon Jesus with the red sash, and I'm looking at this, and I'm, I'm, if I'm honest, I never once even thought to ask my mom or my dad to buy me for, for my birthday the cartoon action figure of Jesus so that I could play Jesus walking on the water or so that I could play Jesus feeding the 5,000 or maybe if it got crazy, he's got a, shep- a sheep on his shoulders, you know, it's like, well, that's like, that's extreme. He's got a sheep, you know? I like, but honestly, I just never, I, I never dreamt about, like, this is what I want to grow up to be. You want to know what I did every day? I played with G.I. Joe action figures. I played with He-Man, you know, Castle of Grayskull. I, I, I mean, I played, this Jesus didn't compare to He-Man in my mind. And so then this is like, why would I want to die to myself and become cartoon Jesus? I don't, I don't want to wear a robe or a red sash. Like, I, I want a sword. <laughs> you know, like that was me. And so, so there's this deal where I started going in, I, is, is following Jesus going to be boring? So Jesus actually talking about this exact subject, I think he addresses that. That idea of is following Jesus, is that going to be like, is it going to be cartoon Jesus? Because notice what Jesus is going to teach about this type of death of what it actually produces, and it's not cartoon boring. Check it out in John. John 12, 24 to 25. Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Okay, so now, this is verse 25 here, this, uh, this second part from anyone. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Sounds like the similar passage we just looked at in Matthew, right? And then, but I like this. He says, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it. Now, that's a little different language there, and quite frankly, it sounds a little, I don't know, disturbing. Anyone else? It's like, does that mean that I'm supposed to like hate living? Does it mean I'm supposed to hate my life? No, that's not what it's about. What he's saying here about hate their life is he's saying you need to despise your life apart from me. You need to despise your old self. You need to despise the sin that's alive in you. You need to despise your flesh. You need to hate those things that, quite frankly, maybe you've allowed to just continue to live in or be present in your life. I think there are aspects of our old life that some of you would be like, I hated that. Like, for example, you might say, 
man, the, the addiction that I had and the way that it just wreaked havoc over my life, I hated that. Some of my old, my old thought patterns, my bad thought patterns, my bad behavior, some of my, man, I'm so glad I'm free of those. I hated those things. But then, I think there's other areas where sin has been allowed to live in your life that quite frankly, you've put up with it and you don't have the attitude of hatred toward it. You are mildly displeased with it. And that's a problem. It's a problem if you're mildly displeased with something that you should actually hate. Let me give you just an example here, okay? There's some sin, and we know it, that offers a form of temporary satisfaction, but all sin comes up leaving you short, shorted in life. It provides a level of temporary satisfaction, but never uh, fulfills you, always comes up short. So picture it like gossip. People wouldn't gossip if it wasn't somewhat fun and somewhat satisfying, right? But they do. People gossip. Why are they gossiping? Well, because there's, there's this high, this, maybe it's an endorphin release of just like releasing information or controlling information and that type of thing. But all, I believe all gossip is rooted in insecurity. That it's ultimately insecurity over oneself that you're holding information, controlling information that you're letting out and talking about other people. So for a moment, it provides a, a little bit of temporary high, emotional high, but it ultimately leaves you feeling more insecure on the other side of it. Always leaves you short. Drugs, alcohol, uh, partying, things like that. People wouldn't do it if it wasn't somewhat satisfying, but it always leaves you, kind of comes up short. Always. And here's our, our problem is if we look at those things with mild distaste in our lives or in our mouths toward it, mild frustration as opposed to I hate it. Because quite frankly, we need to hate the things in us that God hates in us. We, we need to have this attitude that says, I, I loathe, I have such a, a hatred for the, the small thing of sin that I'm allowing to be present in my life. Now, here's why I need to get to a place where I hate it and I kill it. This thing in me has to die because of what Jesus said in verse 24. Check it out, okay? Verse 24, he said this, Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it's going to die. It remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. This is, this is so interesting to me. Unless it, it falls to the ground and dies, it only remains a single seed. Picture your life to be like a seed, okay? That means within a seed is all the potential, all the potential to produce fruit and a harvest that could come from the seed, right? But unless it dies, it doesn't produce anything. So here's your life, and your life is actually designed to produce fruit to produce a harvest but guess what unless it dies guess what your life is only potential that produces nothing God looks at it and goes until it dies it's got nothing this is not about becoming cartoon Jesus this is about becoming a harvest that's amazing to look at because of what God has produced in me now here's the cool thing about a seed so think about um modern day seeds even like now scientists modify them right you, you've got watermelons that are seedless. Well, they're not supposed to be that way. They've been modified so that they're like, that's even better, right? So guess what? Your seed, your life is something. There's, there's potential there. But God allows you to go through things in life so that he can actually insert things into the seed that make it better. That the outcome is actually better. You want to know the things that go into your life that kind of become the, the DNA of the seed's potential. You want to know what they are? They're not just good things. Some of you are like, well, if it's going to be better on the other side, it must be good things that are going in. No, some of the worst things you experience in your life, your trauma, your trials, your heartaches, guess what all that is? All of that is the DNA potential of the seed of your life. That's actually all the all the things that can produce a beautiful and amazing harvest. So everything that you've, you've been so annoyed at going through in life, all your difficulties, all your struggles, and you're like, this is so 
Horrible, I hate it. Guess what? When you sacrifice that thing to the Lord, you surrender it to him and you say, I'm gonna just kill it. I'm not gonna try to control it. I'm gonna give it all over to him. It's only when you do that that the fruit that can come out of it is, has finally the potential to do so. Isn't that awesome? Some of you are like, I think I'm in. No, it's awesome. This is so, it, then it produces many seeds. All I know is I want to be a life that says I can produce many seeds. And that only happens when I die. And I take all of the situations I've gone through in life and I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surrender those things to you. I'm not going to try to control them. I'm going to give them over to you completely. I love, um, there's another illustration that another pastor used, and I l- really liked it. Um, he, he used this illustration of the food network. There's a couple of food shows out there where they have these master chefs, and they'll, they'll bring a whole bunch of random ingredients to these guys. And they just put it in front of them, and then they open it up, and they don't know what, what it, there's going to be in this thing, and what's in the box, who knows. And they open it up, and uh, there's all these like crazy ingredients. That, and, and then what they do to throw a real curveball into the situation is they put something that just doesn't belong at all. Like if there's peanut butter and jelly, they put whatever the opposite of jelly is. Whatever doesn't go with everything else that's in the box, they put that in so that the, so the, the chef is sitting there going, man, how am I going to... Use this, but because they're a master chef, they look at it and they're like, I know how to make that thing perfect within my meal. And so then they make this amazing meal with a whole bunch of things that, quite frankly, they look at and they're like, I don't know how in the world I'm going to make this thing beautiful in this meal. And yet a master chef can take all of this and make it into a beautiful meal. Folks, as long as you're controlling your life and you you haven't died to yourself. Guess what? All the ingredients are there. And you're trying your best to make something beautiful out of it. And in our hands, it just ends up being distasteful. It's only when we die to ourselves and we surrender it to him that the master chef then can take it and make the beautiful meal that he wants to make out of it. He's longing for that in us. That's why he says... You want to really be my follower. You want to, you want to find the life you've been looking for? Well, then you're going to have to lose your life. You're going to have to surrender. You're going to have to die to yourself. Why don't you stand with me here and we'll close in prayer. I believe it's time for a whole lot of us to die to ourselves in some areas. Maybe it's dying to your addiction or dying to your preferences, dying to the jealousy that you've been holding out to, holding on to, dying to your control, your comfort, your unforgiveness, but it's to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna surrender these things. Dying to your, the, the trial. Why don't you bow your heads with me and even right now, why don't you just talk to the Lord in your heart about some of the things that maybe you've been holding on to. Maybe you surrendered it to him before, but you found yourself you taking control of it again, trying to maneuver it, manage it. Jesus, you invited us to follow you. But you didn't just say it, follow me, just like that. It was pick up your cross. Meaning I want you to to process what's going to die right now in you. And so, Lord, I pray for maybe all the areas of our lives that we've been trying to control, things we've been trying to manage on our own that, quite frankly, we're trying to keep alive with our own abilities just going to say needs to die my control of it needs to die for some of us we need to align our thoughts 
with, your, with yours around sin, saying that sin in me needs to die. I need to hate it like you hate it. Not be mildly displeased with it, but hate it. Because when it loses control in my life, then you can produce great fruit in my life. So Lord, I, I pray all throughout the week, all week long, we're probably gonna be reminding ourselves, I need to die to myself. I need to die to myself and have you come alive in me. Die to myself, have you come alive in me. You produce life in me in the situations that I face day by day. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Hey, two things before you leave, two things.